All right, after months of pricing it in and pricing it back out and then waiting for this first cut, we've and, and then apparently, uh, according to the Fed at least, um, potentially like missing the cut at the last meeting, uh, they made up, they finally cut today for the first time, uh, cutting by 50 basis points. Again, most likely because they recognize they probably should have cut in July and they didn't. Um, so now this basically puts their cut in July on the table. Uh, and then obviously today's cut makes that 50 basis points. Um, we'll talk about the market had a very interesting reaction. Uh, was not the reaction that you would have expected. Um, even, even for the buy the rumor, sell the news crowd, not necessarily the ra reaction we would have expected, especially in the Russell 2000, especially in bond yields uh, and the dollar had a, a reversal throughout the day. So we're going to talk all of that. Um, and then, of course, break it down to what we're expecting. Uh, in today's technical analysis class, uh, we always have on Wednesdays, uh, we broke down uh, some long-term charts uh, on the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, kind of what they're showing. Uh, so that kind of uh, today's kind of gives you a little sample of what we talked about there um, and what our expectations are coming out uh, of this meeting now. Now that we are potentially starting a cycle, what does that mean going forward? Uh, for our expectations for this bull market that we've essentially been on um, throughout this sen since again 2009 uh, with that uh, sharp brief dip in rates and with COVID right 2019 and then COVID now we're dropping them again uh, is this now the end of that big long secular bull market we'll break all that down and then take a look at our trade idea for the day and the stock in the communication services sector, so part of those big, those big three cyclical areas uh, that's showing its own signs of weakness. So let's go ahead and get started. Today is Wednesday, September 18th, 2024. This is the Market Outlook from MarketScholars.com. My name is David Settle. Before we get going too far, I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel with this icon here, the red subscribe button down below. Click the thumbs up icon to like our video, comment on anything that stood out to you today, Join our website at marketscholars.com for free. Follow, and like, uh, follow me on Twitter, excuse me, for more content between the videos. I put a lot out there uh, this week regarding today's decision, so make sure you're following me, following me there for more content on Twitter. Uh, and again, join us uh, at our Market Outlook Facebook group that we've created. If you're watching us on our blog, check out some of these other things over here on the right, including our Market Outlook Live video. This is where I take a look at old trades. Uh, we manage the ones that we've put on previous videos, see whether we should stay in them, get out of them. We also put on today's trade already before the market closed. Uh, come down to the bottom, click this heart, it opens up this tab, hit that like button there. Click uh, this thumbs up icon, it takes you to this tab, hit that like button uh, on today's videos. Uh, again, the more you do that, it helps get our content out to all of our followers on those platforms. So thank you to those who do that day in and day out. Uh, those who don't, you can do right now while you're watching with one or two really easy clicks. Right, let's start off taking a look at the S&P 500 with the market forecast indicator. As you can see, the, we had a down day with a long upper shadow. Uh, that tends to be bearish when you have the long upper shadow there. and <coughs> it's, a, it's considered to be, excuse me, a bearish reversal pattern. We did not, however, close below yesterday's low. That's a good sign, relatively good sign. Um, the intermediate line, and it's only a small loss. Right? It's barely above average on the range. It's only a third of a percent. So... We're hardly talking about a big decline here, but again, the long upper shadow means that we did drop quite a bit from the high. And again, that high came immediately after, uh, and I think we retested it again, the actual uh, the decision, interest rate decision. Um, the intermediate line, of course, I mean, a small drop didn't bring the intermediate line down. It's still up, it's still in the reversal zone. The market sentiment line's still falling, but it's also still, at the very least, in bullish territory. Of course, your intermediate lines above market sentiments, that's bullish as well. Uh, the near-term line is down in the bearish territory and you have an oversold momentum line again. This is a classic buy the dip signal right here on the market forecast pattern. Strong bullish posture, oversold momentum line, and a bearish near-term line. Now, without being too extreme, right, without being in the reversal zone, now the momentum line is a little too low. Like it's, we don't typically like it to be kind of like this where it's, um, you know, below 20, but not below, excuse me, not extremes. Uh, it is the fifth percentile is an extreme low. So that makes me a little bit cautious about this by the dip. But just in and of itself, this is a bullish signal. Oversold momentum line, strong bullish posture, bearish near-term line. That's a, 
uh, opportunity for us to bounce right off of that and start a new near-term rally, right? Start a new near-term run. This near-term run was pretty good, and we would anticipate a new one uh, coming out of this one. I would like to give it a day just to make sure uh, that this, you know, to see that this momentum line actually bounces out here too, uh, without it, you know, staying down here. But if it stays down here, then there's a good chance the momentum line follows it down, right? Because that's the concern: is do we get, you know, coming off of a bullish near-term peak? Which is great. Uh, are we going to get a Are we going to get a bullish near term low? That bounce here would be a bullish near term low. Um, but this is again, this is day one of the near term line being below sixty. Uh, what you know, it takes two days for it to get from above sixty to getting below twenty uh, and produce a bearish near term peak. So tomorrow's day two. So that's why I say that's you know again, the, the, I anticipate that we'll bounce out of this tomorrow. But just in case the near the momentum line stays down. And the moment near term line comes down with it and produces a bearish slow, I'd be a little hesitant. So again, a bearish slow in and of itself is not a bad thing unless it's followed, you know, unless it's either preceded or followed up with by a bearish near term peak. Uh, this obviously was not preceded by a bearish near term peak. This is pretty bullish, and we'd have to see if the next peak on the near term line would be bearish. Uh, with the near with the intermediate line as high as it is, you wouldn't anticipate that it would be. Um, but obviously you can see like it happens. It happens here uh, on that last near-term peak uh, The very all-time high that we had at the time uh, ended up being a bearish uh, peak But it came off of a bullish low point, right? So once we got bearish lows, then you can see it was you know, it was hard to get right back up to a bullish peak So let's see what happens here tomorrow um, with uh, this day two of the near-term line dropping below 60 and see if we actually do get a bearish near-term low here. If you take a look at the NASDAQ 100, uh, same thing. It's almost the exact same pattern. The only difference is the intermediate line's not above the 80th percentile and it actually did turn lower. So we do have light pink shading already on the near-term line. And, and another, day to, another day, like we just talked about, you know, with the near-term line following the momentum line into the reversal zone, another day would suggest um, that we probably get a, a bull tag. Uh, tomorrow light pink shading in the yellow line so uh, the, the, inter the intermediate line the near term line excuse me cross below the intermediate line which is a bearish crossover uh, and the um, the but the intermediate line at least is still above this falling market sentiment which is actually a lot lower uh, than the S&P's market sentiment line if you take a look at the Russell 2000 um, you can see its near term line is also crossed below the intermediate line. Its intermediate line also has not crossed above the 80th percentile yet. It's going up at a faster clip. Remember, the near term line is actually dropping, or the NASDAQ's intermediate line, excuse me, is actually dropping. The Russell's has not yet. Um, but still, that's a bearish crossover. Uh, and we're not necessarily in the reversal zone yet on the intermediate line. And then you have an oversold momentum line. So, again, a chance. That we can bounce off of this right just bounce right off of this but considering the last time we had a long upper shadow with a with a kind of like a dragonfly doji or tombstone jo doji is what they call these patterns they tend to be pretty bearish and we'll see if this one ends up doing the same thing that the last time it did uh, there uh, into the beginning of august all right if we take a look now at the long-term chart the weekly chart You'll see um, that again. We still have the bullish candle, so one day doesn't change that, um, you know. But again, the idea, the the pretend we we're not closing above the high as of right now, and we are setting ourselves up for, you know, a potential another transition candle next week. So uh, that's something to keep an eye on. The Nasdaq 100 obviously is not nearly as bullish uh, at all. If you know, if you follow that cursor to the left, and the PPO is actually still falling here. Uh, and converging so we are definitely still in convergence mode uh, on the Nasdaq 100 if you take a look at the uh, three green arrow chart obviously we still have three green arrows all across the board you can see the long upper shadows especially like I said in the Russell 2000 um, you know makes us a little cautious uh, the MACD histogram uh, for the other indexes have already turned down uh, remember they didn't you know we've already had our surge of momentum here uh, and in the middle of August. So we weren't going to get another surge. Most likely we weren't going to get another surge and it looks like we're already starting to peter out here. If I look at the two line version of this chart, you can see we're still above moving averages. Uh, that There's that long upper shadow again. You can see the histogram. MACD is still 
above its moving average for the time being. If you take a look at the Qs, uh, it's also still barely above its averages. They're, they're a lot more tightly clumped uh, than the S&P. Of course, nowhere near the all-time high like the S&P has already passed. And the MACD you can see is, clo you know, is, is uh, the histogram starting to roll down there uh, to the downside, but nothing too significant yet in terms of crossing over. Um, the DMI, the positive indicator, still can't get above 25. Right, it's got to get above 25 for us to have any idea of a trend. Uh, the negative indicator actually continued lower despite the drop, um, and the ADX is really low too. Uh, looking at the Qs, uh, same kind of pattern here. The, you know, the positive indicator looks like is looking like it may end up peaking here uh, instead of crossing above it and starting a new trend. And that's uh, that. Obviously, that would be a little bit of a concern for the prospects of a bullish move starting here. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's our uh, RSI, still still bullish, still in the upper half of the chart. Hasn't crossed below 50, much less into bearish territory yet. Um, the CCI also failing as of right now at that 100 level. Again, you know, if, you're, if we're going to maintain some bullish trending moves, we've got to get above that 150 mark on these bullish swings higher, and we, we're not uh, doing that. And we definitely don't want to swing below minus 100. Uh, that typically associates itself with uh, weakness. Um, so that's, you know, you can kind of see we're, a little bit of a danger there if we can't break through tomorrow and and if we follow up with this weakness tomorrow into more weakness into the end of the week you can kind of see how uh how bearish that would end up being for us from an ichimoku cloud we're still well above the cloud the rate of change is still clearly positive again we do not have a trend developed here so that's really the biggest issue is we're not necessarily too bearish per se but we just can't get a trend going we're now not in upper quartile anymore the momentum is is bullish but very very weak the bands themselves not outside of the Keltner channel yet which it has to be to be trending um, so I mean that's probably our biggest issue is we we did not come out of this move with a bullish enough of a day um, to to get a trend going uh, to establish a trend um, I, but but we're also not too bearish um, that that things are, are going in the wrong direction they're still okay Everything's still in a positive direction. We just haven't built up enough strength yet to actually be trending. If we take a look at the uh, intraday we, uh, move, you can see we ended up closing near the low of the day, uh, higher high right immediately after the um, FOMC announcement. Uh, we ended up testing it briefly, but then coming back and, and testing uh, yesterday's low, but not breaking through. That's a very good sign uh, that we at least held these lows. Um, right now as of now because you break those lows there's not a whole lot of volume support on an intraday basis so that's a good sign uh, on the s p the Qs. same thing you break through those lows of the past couple of days and there's not a whole lot of volume support it's very top heavy four week range so as of right now everything is okay um on the s p and the Qs. we got this one touch um so far so one touch and then we got to 100 on the green line um, that that's really positive. Uh, so we you know again we're not we're not we didn't get some bullish we didn't get some confirming moves today on the market to really like confirm the beginning or at least the continuation of this bullish trend. But we also didn't get anything that would uh, end uh, the prospects for this bullish move uh, yet at least. Uh, I showed you the volume and trading range uh, both num uh, both of these numbers. Sorry, let's go to S and P. Um, both of these are right around um, uh, the average, a little bit above the average there. 58 million shares trading down there is also above the average. And again, that average is still relatively high. Uh, so we need that average to get down below, you know, five point, five and a half points. So we can get below 1% and again, establish a bullish trend. And you can see the volume, as I mentioned before, you know, it's going to be hard for the volume to really get going too much lower because we're already near. 52 week lows so it's more likely than not to go up than it is to go down which obviously does that typically during declines more so um, <coughs> during rallies uh, the VIX um, gapped up pulled back throughout most of the day finished on a high note but still finished at pretty decent levels below 20 uh, below 90 percent on the VIX to VIX 3m uh, ratio uh, the VIX stayed high so I was hoping that we could get the VIX down after the FOMC below 100, because um, that would suggest that a lot of the uh, cost or concern has been taken out of the market now. Obviously, that's not the case. So there's still issues here uh, with 
uh, the markets are, you know, the in this case, the options market still has some concern uh, about um, uh, the the S and P 500 and its prospect. And you can see we we close. We're still above the 200 day. We end up closing up above um, these moving averages here. So um, and so, yeah, you can see that here, if I were just to look at it this way, yeah, we close above all of them. Um, so you know that's a just a sign that we're a little bit elevated uh, on volatility and, and like I said with the higher VVIX there's a possibility that the VIX can continue to rise going into the end of this week and, and coming out of, of, of uh, September expiration. If you look at the seasonality for volatility uh, there still is an opportunity for volatility to rise from this point uh, or yes tomorrow at least um, going into pretty much the end of October. Um, there's an opportunity for volatility to rise uh, from mid-July and it started a little earlier, but the trend has been, we've been following that trend and it looks like we probably will continue to follow a trend to the upside, at least from, again, from a seasonality perspective going through the end of October there. All right, now let's take a look at what's driving this action. Of course, we know what happened, uh, what the biggest driver today of the market was and it was uh, the FOMC rate decision. Let's take a look at what it did to the various uh, asset classes <coughs> Again, just today alone. Take a look here at uh, the five minute chart. You can see the initial reaction is very positive. I mean, look, small cap stocks were up two and a half percent at their peak. They ended up only flat on the day. Uh, that's how big of a 180 it did. You know, it was flat going into the rate decision. Again, up two and a half percent and then flat coming out of it. Hence the big long tail, right? That's a, that's a tremendous long tail. Again, tends to be very bearish. If you were to take a look again at the last time we had that long upper shadow on the Russell 2000. Uh, let's see, it's over here. So it was, uh, where was it? Uh, let's see, right there. Um, if I can pull it, there we go. So right there, uh, it's July 31st. Um, well, we can take a look at July 31st here. So let's pull this up to July uh, 3rd, uh, let's go to 25th um, and take a look at it over there. Give it a second to load itself up. Actually, let's do, this is due 31st. Let's just look at the 31st by itself. July 31st on the five minute chart. <coughs> there's that long upper shadow again we were kind of flat uh, we ended up two and a half percent up uh, at the peak again this would have been uh, FOMC day this was an FOMC day I believe uh, on July 31st uh, we rallied up to the upside let me just make sure yes you can see your July 31st was an FOMC day it was also an FOMC day and um, we went into the meeting uh, right up about a half a percent two-thirds of a percent rallied up to two and a half percent full drop to the downside uh, and that's exactly what we saw there today so a very similar type move of course not a similar uh, in fact uh, the fed was was some people thought that they could start hiking rates in that meeting obviously they didn't uh, and now uh, the thought was if you've been following me on twitter you know that the signs were there for 50 basis point cut uh, i just posted over the past few days all sorts of posts uh, talking about the prospects of a 50 basis point cut and how the Fed does it, right? The, it was very likely uh, that we were going to get one. Um, and which basically means that the Fed's recognizing that they should have cut rates in July. That's what they're saying. They, they were too late. They should have cut rates in July. And now they're catching up to having two cuts now uh, by this meeting instead of uh, just the one by, by doing two cuts at the same time. Uh, that's really all they, that's why they cut rates for 50 basis points. Uh, what's interesting though is the impact it had on yields. Yields actually rolled. Look at bonds dropping like a rock today. Um, they were down a little bit going into the meeting and rallied after, but then really took a fell. The dollar had the opposite direction. The dollar actually dropped um, and then rallied and ended up being the best performing asset class on the day um, by the time uh, the day was over. So let's take a look at some of their charts. Let's take a look at the yield chart of yields first and there's our move up four basis points at 3.68 percent uh, you can see we're above that eight day moving average macd has turned pot the histogram has turned positive 
Um, the stochastic still deeply negative. So we haven't like we haven't uh, broken out here. We haven't gotten above the 17 day. Uh, we did that already a couple of times here, and we failed both times. The last two times, really, the last three times, you try to get above the 17 day. Um, you know, four or five, if you can, all these instances too. And they failed at all of them. So, you know, and today we didn't even get about the 17. So there, you know, let, let's keep our eyes on that. I don't think necessarily we're, you know, taking off to the upside per se. If you take a look at the dollar index, uh, here, let's pull up the regular chart here on the dollar index. It had a big, long, lower shadow. Um, so you can see the big, long, lower shadow there. If you take, let's take a look at the, uh, currency comparison chart. Uh, we'll just go to again just today. Uh, remember this: the, today's currency chart starts uh, overnight, um, so we'll go to a 10-minute chart there. Um, let's see. No, that's not. I don't want commodities. Sorry, wrong chart. I want currencies. There we go. And then let's look at today on the currency chart. And we'll come over here. There we go. Here, let's do um, the 10 minute chart so we can get a little bit of context. So, there we were going into, and you can see the dollar was down against the pound, the Australian dollar, all these currencies. It was actually up against the yen, um, and then we had the, the, the FOMC decision, and you can see everything rallied uh, up to the upside. Everything took off against the dollar, including the yen. But by the time the day was done, uh, again, the only currencies that were higher were the pound, the euro was flat. Uh, but the yen was way down, right? So we take a look at the yen. The yen was down against everybody here, which is generally actually a pretty positive development uh, for um, risk appetite uh, when um, the yen is is underperforming because that's the most safety trade of all safety trades in the Forex market at least. And you can see the long lower shadow. After a pretty good day yesterday, um, that long lower shadow again tends to be bullish when you get long lower shadows. And we'll see if that turns out again. It almost looks like the 10 year yield. MACD is positive. So CASX uh, is deeply oversold still. Your, your commodities are still relatively bullish. They ended up coming down by the end of the day, um, but still have been making their run. Again, that's not the three headed monster that we want uh, rising commodities, rising yields, and a rising dollar. In 2022, that was our recipe for bearishness. <coughs> and that's been the recipe. Uh, for bullishness for a long for, a, for since then essentially if you take if I were to go all the way back let's go to the asset class comparison chart and let's go all the way back to um, uh, the beginning of 2023 so at the end of 2022 uh, going forward you can see uh, commodities have been bearish yields have been relatively flat um, they've been uh, bonds have been down so yields have been up a little bit but they're uh, relatively flat, definitely off of their lows there in October. And then you can see um, the dollar. Uh, there's the dollar's also been uh, down and not nearly as bullish. Again, if I were to go back to 2022, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, let's go to 2022 here. Again, that's the combination strong bullish, strong dollar, strong commodities, strong yields. And now the dollar is down from that peak. Commodities are down from their peak, and yields are, you know, up or kind of are um, down relatively from their peak. Right. This is so. This is bond prices up off of their lows. Um, so, so that's why we've been so bullish. So the last thing we want to see now again is yields to take back off, commodities to take back off because inflation expectations are taking back off, and then the dollar also to rise. Remember. The point of rate cuts, and I, and I did tweet this out, and I'll bring this up so you can see that here. Uh, the point of rate cuts is to stimulate money, velocity of money. That's the point. Uh, soft landings means they get that right, right? So velocity is dropping, velocity is dropping in all these instances, and then they, they drop rates. So you can see in the 1990, they, they caught it in time without it dropping any further. Um, we ended up with a recession, but it was very mild. Uh, we didn't even get a bear market out of it, just a correction. And then the velocity increased during that rate cutting cycle from 90 to 92. The mid 90s, they caught it, right? Velocity was dropping. They started cutting rates. They caught it. It didn't drop any further. In 1998, velocity was dropping. They cut rates at mid cycle adjustment. Velocity rose again. Um, over here in 2019, um, they were doing okay until COVID. And obviously, COVID made velocity really drop down. The times where they did not catch it 
you can see when they started cutting rates in 2001, velocity kept going down throughout the recession uh, and then started to bounce after the recession was over. In 2007, they almost caught it. Velocity started to turn back up, um, but then we had Bear Stearns and some issues in early 2008, and we dropped, and they kept dropping and went down the whole recession uh, and then eventually turned higher. So, so that's, what, that's basically what differentiates a soft landing from a hard landing. Uh, but regardless, in either landing, velocity turns up. Uh, so, and as we talked about right now, um, when you look at uh, when you look at the if I were to go back and show you um, the the money supply in the system, there still is an enormous amount of money supply in the system. You can see a 40% increase in the supply of money from 2020 to 2023 total. Uh, including a drawdown, a pretty significant drawdown in 2023. So even net the drawdown in 2023, we still increase the money supply by 40%. Uh, obviously, the money supply is going to grow to some degree, but this is, you know, we ended up growing it in excess of about three and a half million dollars based off the trend that we based that we had going in to 2020. Uh, so that's a bit. There's a lot of money despite the drawdown in 2023. That's a lot of money still in the system, and if velocity turns back higher, then inflation expectations will ramp back up again. And that's, you know, again, kind of why you th why you see um, on a day like today that yields actually be up, um, and commodities uh, could also go up in uh, in conjunction with that, uh, because the idea is uh, the idea is that that if 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 they get it right if this is indeed a soft landing uh, and velocity money turns back higher and real gdp stays at you know at you know again not 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 recession levels uh, but 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 low levels not not as strong as it's been uh, then we'll start to see uh, inflation go up there's you can see that that big drop in bonds uh, relatively big drop in bonds uh, from the meeting going forward again reflects the idea that what they're doing is going to spark um, a new round of inflation expectations um, because of the money that is still um, out there, the money that's still in the system that hasn't been fully drawn out yet, still a lot of excess money uh, in the system. I told you that there's an excess of three and a half trillion dollars that includes the drawdown. So before 2023, it was obviously a far more excess so we've drawn down some of that excess. We still have three and a half trillion left uh, to draw down, and it doesn't look like we're going to be drawing it down anymore. And instead, we'll be starting to really change uh, that money. Will start changing hands pretty rapidly again as the cost of money goes down. That's the point. That's the point of what the Fed's starting to do today with all the rate cuts that they're expected to do uh, throughout the next two years. You can see the. I don't think they have the dot plot up yet. No, this is still uh, based off of June. Uh, so they don't have the dot plot up yet here. So here's a good comparison of the dot plot that we had. Uh, you can see, and you can see it over here as well. Um, the previous dot plot was around this one to two cuts. Um, and you can see that right here. There's the one to two cuts. Um, now, um, you know, we're, we're expected to have, you know, four cuts um, by the end or 100 basis points of cuts. And you can also see the next year's projection is way down here too, expected to be here uh, between basically three and three and a half percent, three and a quarter percent. So in other words, now the Fed themselves, so that's way down here, the Fed themselves are expecting that they'll cut 200 basis points. Again, the Fed has never cut the Fed funds rate by more than a third, in this case almost 40 percent, without there being a recession. So the Fed themselves are basically projecting uh, that this is going to be more than just a little mid-cycle adjustment, soft landing type scenario. Um, they've also never cut interest rates by 50 basis points during a soft landing um, scenario. So um, the Fed themselves, based off their own projections, now their own projections are always right. So that's why we don't necessarily think, oh, go, we're going to bear market now. Nope. They could be wrong too, for all we know. But right now they're expecting recession by the end of next year um, because they're expecting to reduce the Fed funds rate by 40%. Um, by the end of next year and even by then as I've mentioned before that still wouldn't be enough at 200 basis points That still wouldn't be enough now. There's been some considerable uh, damage done here 
We were at 140 basis points. Now we're only 100 basis points. Uh, so there's a lot of damage here. And if you take a look at like the three month uh, bill, um, the 10 year increased, you can see the three month is down, uh, down to below 4.8%. So the short end is going down while the 10 year, uh, it actually, as we, as we talked about, actually went up a little bit. Isn't that fascinating? So that combination has done quite a bit of damage to the yield spread. Uh, that we have and and there's as i as we talked about before there's a lot more that it has to do to get back up to its normal 100 plus basis point range which is typically at typically it's above 200 basis points but um, we have a long long ways to go if with the tenure at 3.71 100 basis points puts the fed funds down to two and three quarters uh, again without the tenure dropping or moving up at all um, that kind of gives you an idea of how much work the Fed has left to do and, and what they are anticipating themselves to end up doing um, by the end of next year. And so before we wrap up, let's take a look at our trade idea of the day. I wanted to take a look at Electronic Arts. It actually looks pretty similar to uh, Adobe we looked at earlier for a trade idea here previously. You can see the stock is um, two days in a row now, we kind of failed at that 30-day moving average. We're back to dark pink shading and red line. The intermediate line turned down. Market sentiment lines pointed lower. It's actually dropping pretty quickly here. So we went from a bullish near-term peak that didn't last very long to a pretty strongly bullish, in fact, the most bearish, excuse me, uh, near-term low point there. Um, if you take a look at the weekly chart uh, for EA, uh, obviously you have some bearish candles over the past couple of weeks. We're below a falling 10-week moving average. Uh, we've been fluctuating with those red and green arrows. The PPO is clearly falling. The, the size of the candle you can see is below its moving average down there. If you take a look at the three green arrow chart, we obviously have three red arrows, uh, have had for a while, and now we've got some extra volume uh, with this last couple of days. Uh, we've also dropped below that 50-day moving average, uh, failed at the 30 and the 50. Uh, we're dropping towards that 200, making a run at the point of control, MACD, and stochastics you can see at bearish levels. They're not the only oscillators at bearish levels. You can see the DMI is also at bearish levels above, uh, almost above 30, but at least above 25 and below 20 on the positive indicator. Your um, ADX is already above 20 and rising. Uh, looking at the RSI and the CCI, they're also at bearish levels for the first time for the RSI and uh, CCI getting back to minus 150 again. You can see the weekly CCI hasn't, has not crossed below minus 100 yet, so it's working its way down. Has now crossed below zero at least. Uh, again, the week's not over with, of course. Uh, looking at the Ichimoku cloud, uh, you can see we have uh, the beginnings of an intermediate trend strength. Uh, now that we're almost to minus two and we're above 65, we're also below the cloud now. Uh, the rate of change is clearly negative. The green line is below the blue line there. And then finally looking at the Bollinger Bands and the Keltner Channels, excuse me, you can see that we are at the lowest uh, quartile uh, of our bandwidth, sitting right on that band. The bandwidth is rising, uh, and the bandwidth for the first day is crossed out of the Keltner channel. Uh, we're pushing against that lower Keltner channel as well, have not closed below it quite yet either. Uh, so really a significant move uh, to the downside uh, for EA and gives us an opportunity for a bearish trade. Uh, so what I decided to do was to um, buy the at the money, considering it's already made a pretty bearish move, buy the at the money, buy one strike away, which happens to be the low 20 delta. Uh, so this is what it looks like here. Position sizing for our normal directional risk, about 500 bucks. That's half our normal risk that we take on a trade. And then, you know, again, about a two to one reward to risk ratio. And that's the flexibility we have on the trade for timing's sake, right? In case we have to, you know, wait it out a little bit of time, because like I said, it's already made its move down. So it might, you know, bounce up a little bit here and kind of get a little exhaust, uh, oversold technical bounce. Um, so I have some opportunity, some timing, some time and flexibility for that to happen. Obviously, we get out of this trade if if it bounced up too much and the max gain ended up coming out of um, that one standard deviation window there. All right, well, that does it for today. You've heard from me now, and I want to hear from you. Use that link popping out in the top right corner of your screen. That takes you to our Market Outlook Forum. Open up any new thread with any questions or comments you have. Reply to anybody else's thread, and let's keep this conversation going in between videos. Again, thank you very much for watching. Remember, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that thumbs up icon. Comment on the video. Join us at marketscholars.com for free. Follow and like us on Twitter and Facebook as well. Have a great rest of your Wednesday night, everybody, and we'll see you all tomorrow.